Erev Tov Chavim. Good evening, my friends. I want to bring to you guys some uh, some information here, a little bit of news to start with here, and uh, kind of pick up on some issues that I want to be talking to you about, uh, going into some detail of some, some particular uh, issues. Uh, but I think the most important thing that I could update you on right now is the news uh, that I have been receiving from different friends uh, from around the country. Uh, I got in an email from a good friend named Gary, and Gary says to me here that uh, in the Aviation Week and Space Technology magazine issue that came out on July 28th of this year, it says, here are some of the key points made in the article entitled, New Reality, Budget Cuts, Strategy Shift, Prompt Massive Israel Military Force Reductions. Uh, if we are making a mistake, I will. it will be hard to fix, says IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Benny Gans, who was forced to absorb a reduction of $800 million in the 2013 defense budget, including the immediate response and ordering a cessation of most of the ground forces training. I am not happy about the cuts, says Gans. Uh, another another interesting point here, uh, this is some of the reasoning behind it. The second major reason, in the additional to the fiscal concerns, is the perceived geostrategic geostr changes in the region, which reduce the likelihood of a conventional conflict, says former IAF Commander-in-Chief Major General Ido Nakhastan. The perception referenced Aviation Week is that the Syrian army is not considered as a potential threat because it is engaged in civil war with rebel fighters, which now include Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah from Lebanon, Iranian troops, and Russian material support. The Egyptian army is also not perceived as a threat as it is engaged in dealing with the uh, internal problems within Egypt, including the Muslim Brotherhood. So a system, uh, uh, excuse me, a symmetric enemy is unlikely. That's kind of interesting that uh, their reasoning is coming on this. I, 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 quite frankly, friends, uh, there's so much talk of economic collapse, things of those natures there. And I'm afraid that the big picture that we're missing here is the economic pressure that is being put on Israel from all around the world, whether it be the EU and the sanctions there. Uh, no doubt there has been um, cuts. We got 800 million for the military and training and stuff has been cut from the budget. Well, thank you, United States, uh, Mr. Uh, Obama, for, for doing these cuts here. But, you know, in one way, even though it really irritates me to see the world turn against my own people, at the same token, uh, it kind of reminds me of how God does things. He typically likes to uh, weaken the situation down uh, so that when he goes to battle for us, it just proves that much greater of a miracle. Uh, and, and what's also ironic as well is that our people are being forced back to what a little nine mile stretch of land to live on now. Uh, six million Jews, and that's not counting the Jews from around the world. If we wanted to go home, how could we go home? Uh, no place to go to. And uh, interesting that the Muslim world can have enough land space that encompasses more than what the United States is and plenty of ample room for Palestinians to live in with them, but yet, no, uh, we must divide. Israel is the consensus of the world, uh, the humanitarian rights organizations, etc. cetera. Uh, needless to say, I'm not happy about any of these things, but nonetheless, God is going to show who he stands for. And for those of you that, uh, that are against Israel, I guess you'll find out the hard way as well. Um, I do want to mention something here in, in, the, in the scheme of things. Oh, let me mention another news uh, point here as well. Uh, the Palestinians, and I think I've already reported this to you, one of their chief negotiators has already been heard to say, he was caught on, on audio, uh, that the peace agreement with the Israelis, that the Palestinians should not fear anything because it's only a pretext. They'll break the covenant anyway and turn on Israel. Well, that kind of figures, I guess we should say. Um, there's some things I want to bring out, though. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to talk to you about. One, I, I, before I even get started here, there is, 
There is one thing. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go into this in a little bit. There's an apology I want to make to you of an error that I that I made with a brother. Uh, let me just tell you the, the mistake I made. Then I want to come back and address it after I address some of the issue here with Israel. There was a brother that sent me a video response to the... Um, the debate in Genesis where God says let us create man in our own image and my brother I do want to apologize to you I answered to him in an email Gabriel and that is definitely not right uh, after watching the debate with Tovia Singer and a minister that he was debating with I got kind of caught up in that spirit of debate and it's never been a belief of mine in the past and I don't <clears throat> let me say when I say I want to apologize about this God knows my heart I, I, I'm not interested in making people feel good and, and and I don't mean to make you feel bad either I, I want to tell you what's truth and that's what is the most important thing to me but when God said let us make men in our own image I allowed that moment when that brother asked me that question to make that type of foolish statement back to him. I believe, and, and, I, and this here would be to Tobia Singer, my brother, Rabbi Tobia Singer, I, I, I disagree with you when you say that God is schizophrenic. Because he said, let us make man in our image. Then let's look at what our image is then. We are a three-part creature. We are both soul, body, and spirit is what makes us up. Okay, now, <clears throat> the funny thing is, though, you see the flesh side of us, but if our body dies, we still live on because we have a soul, body, and a spirit. And God is made the same way. Now, the difference that I have, and I guess in one way with the Trinitarian brethren that believe that there are three persons and one God. There's many Trinitarians that believe the way that I would believe as well. We would have the same revelation, the same understanding, but there's also a lot of Trinitarian brothers and sisters as well that don't quite understand it the way that I do. And of course, that doesn't make me right, but I am passionate in believing that there is only one God. But when God said, let us make man in our own image, I don't think he was schizophrenic. But God is soul, body, and spirit. And just as we reason within ourselves on something we're going to do, we're all, if I were to say guilty of that, we're all guilty of that. You know, we begin to, to reason out in our minds, what are we going to do about this? Or what are we going to do about that? And I believe that this is exactly what God was doing, was reasoning with himself. And to make another statement in this, something that came to my mind, my wife is actually the one that caught me on saying this. She says, I can't believe you said that. And justifiably so. It needed to be corrected. But because my wife know, has known that I've never believed like that. And, uh, and, I, and I told her, I just honestly, honey, I said, I got caught up in the middle of that debate there and <clears throat> I let it influence me knowing better. And that's normally when I get in trouble, is when I allow something like that to influence my mind, when prayerfully I know what God wants me to actually say. So, uh, but in this regard here though, let's say this here, when God says we are both, when he, when he shows us that we are uh, both soul, body, and spirit, also keep in mind, Paul in the Christian text writes, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, our human body, we have one already waiting for us. So we are, in this life, we are only a negative, and in the realm or the dimension beyond what we live in here, <clears throat> the positive side of us is standing there, a real image. That's why even when the, you look at a rapture scripture, for, for example, uh, where it says, we shall all, all, all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, you see? changed what what why because the flesh cannot inherit eternal life so there has to come a change but yet if the body is dissolved we have one waiting for us but does that make us three persons because you have to remember if god made us in his image then we have to ask the question then are we three persons because some people look at that and they say well you know god was talking to the son and then maybe a little bit to the holy ghost and 
You see, that's where I don't get into that part there. The idea of three different gods, three separate gods. But the thing is, you have to keep in mind, when we look at the Son, Jesus Christ, that part of God's being came into existence when he was born, born of a virgin birth. But when God first, and as I take you back, and I said I wasn't going to go into this right now, maybe I should, maybe I should pick this back up in a little bit. But all right, maybe all right, I'll try, I'll try to go ahead and do this. All right, look. In Genesis, like for example, when we were looking at the debate with Tobias Singer, if any of you guys see any of the debates he does, there are several things that he that he gets into. One of the things that the Christian minister gets into is the pluralization of Elohim, God, and as the rabbi does, Elohim. He puts a pause in there because it does represent Hashem or Yehovah. It does represent who God really is, Elohim. But it's the attributes of God being expressed. And as many of you that maybe have watched videos before, I've explained this to you so that you can understand. It doesn't mean there's multiple gods, but it's the same God. The same eternal being, as Moses said, he's invisible and cannot be seen, became expressed in the world that we live in in order to have fellowship with us. That's why we read when it says, John in, in the Christian Bible writes, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what was, in, what was the first word in the beginning? Well, God says the first word that he actually speaks out of his own mouth when he says, when we're reading in, in Genesis, it says, Ve'yomer uh, Elohim, and he, God, says, Yahi Or. Now, we translate that, let there be light, but it's actually eternity coming into an expression. It is, it is a greater expression than just say, let there be. And it's not speaking of the sun, the Shemesh. And, and I know there's some of you that have been asking me to go into the deeper into that because of Lila, the, the night, the, the Choshek, the darkness. And there, he's really separating good from evil is what he's doing. And I'll get into that later, but that's a very deep subject and not quite ready to go into that at this point with you. Um, but that's where God first comes into being. Now, another point that I've made to you, for example... In the Christian Bible, we read everything that there was and that, 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 that's here was created by Jesus Christ. And nothing was that's here, you know, I, I wish I knew the scripture off the top of my head. In other words, Jesus Christ created everything. So that's what tells us he was there back in the beginning. So where was he in the beginning then? He was the light. John makes that clear. In the beginning was the word. Well, that first word was light coming into existence. That was the Logos, the pillar of fire, the expression of the Almighty. But we read also in the Torah that everything that exists and is created was created by Yehovah. But yet, even the name Yehovah is just like Jesus Christ when it says in Hebrews 13, 8, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yehovah is also in like manner. He was, He is, He shall forever be. It's made up of those three compounds in there, just like uh, Yeshua is. All right? But, now, if both of these are claiming to be the creators of everything on the earth, where is the problem at? Or is there a problem? Because in the Christian theology, they believe that it's three persons of the Godhead in one, and that's how they did it. But then there comes up a problem what we have in Genesis because in Genesis it says Be'oshit bara Elohim et ha-shemayim et ha-aretz At the first, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you would think Elohim, well that's plural, so it was, God, it was Jesus and God together creating. It's not possible because it is a sing the word created is singular. And in Hebrew, if it's plural, or if there is more than one that was there doing the creation, the verb would have to be plural as well. And we don't see the verb plural. We don't see Be'oshit, Bohim, Elohim, at the Shemai. If Bohim would have been there, we would have realized that there was more than one God, or more than one person, if you want to take it like that. But <clears throat> when I look at the Trinity, I'm not so much against the Trinity when we recognize that uh, <clears throat> Yehovah, 
Hashem, God Almighty Himself, is able to impart Himself or to be whatever He desires to be. And in this case here, He said, Ve'yomer Elohim Yahiyod. He became that light. He created that, that light to be able to have fellowship with mankind. It's the same Yehovah that spoke to Abraham when he was here on the earth. Now some say, well, that was a, that was Jesus, and then there was a there was a, God was with him, and it shows the Trinity there as well. No, <clears throat> it, you, you get it all mixed up when you do that. You know, in that case, it had to have been one of the angels, because it does say Melech, angels, three angels appeared to them. It doesn't even say strangers so much; it just says angels appeared. But see, Abraham called one of them Yehovah. And so that's the important thing that we need to see there. So, again, my apology, brother. I hope you get to see this video. I hope I didn't discourage you to the point that you wouldn't listen. Uh, I, I cannot remember. I get so many emails, so many videos that come to me. So if I can't find it personally, I will try to let you know and give you my apology on that uh, for making that mistake. Uh, let me go though. There's some other things I really want to talk to you about uh, rather quickly and keep in mind too I, I really have strongly on my heart to address the debate of Tobia Singer especially Because of the impact that it had on Nehemiah Gordon Nehemiah he is It basically I can see it kind of renewed his heart to Judaism and to the faith of our fathers and I guess in the light of some of the teachings in Christianity, I can't really blame him. And that's something you have to understand. There are so many things that are twisted up. Uh, and, and as Rabbi Tobia Singer puts out, he says this the mistranslations for the sake of, of um, <clears throat> for Christology, for example. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you what, let me, let me address one of these that is so common amongst the Jewish people to really beat up the Christian on. And that is, uh, a virgin shall conceive. Um, we read this in Isaiah, you know, uh, when it says a virgin shall conceive and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, in Hebrew it says Ha'alma. Ha'alma means the young maiden. And so what happens with the, with the rabbinical scholars, they go out there and they really attack the Christians because they say, well, it doesn't literally say virgin, although there are places where the word Alma is translated as virgin. But <clears throat> the Christians, for some reason, they don't know how to come back and stand for what they really believe. And this troubles me. You know, it troubles me that the rabbis would attack it when the scripture plainly says, Ha'alma, and he's going to say his name, Shemot Emmanuel. You know, if, if we can take, for example, now let me just say this to the rabbis that, that, that might listen to this. The implications of a virgin should be automatically accepted in this particular case. One, a young woman is going to conceive and have a child. And this child is going to be called God with us. Now, why would the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, say something like this if it's not prophetic? Do you think Yeshayahu is just writing things just to write them? Do you not? I mean, come on. We should know better. The, 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 the Torah and the Tanakh, every, everything that is written in the Tanakh, it's the word of Almighty God. And then what about Hatsua? We take the rock, and because we have the hay in front of the, the word Sua, the definite article, then we take in the case of the rock, it's the same rock. That rock becomes special because there's a definite article, hey, in front of it. But when it comes to Hama, oh, well, you know, Hama, Hama, so what? I mean, do you not get, do you not think that Yeshayahu does not know what he's talking about? 
This young woman is going to have a child and his name is going to be called Emmanuel. You know, we're so busy straining every little fault we can find with Christianity that we're missing the main picture. And I'm going to deal with these things. You know, you guys really, my rabbinical brethren, you really like to pound on them. You know, a rabbi says the other day, he says, well, Yeshua, he could not be the sacrifice because the sacrifice could not be over three years old. And he could not have blemishes and, and, and Yeshua, he was circumcised. The sacrifices are not made. The sacrifices were to type God's life that he was going to give for our life. Do you think the goat could come back upon us, the life of the goat? The first sin that ever happened in the Garden of Eden, God had to kill a lamb and put the clothing of the lamb upon Adam and Eve for a blood atonement. But that life of the goat could not come back upon them. But he put those angels there to guard the way the tree of life, Eitz Chaim. You know good and well the Eitz Chaim was breathed in their nostrils. They had to have lost Eitz Chaim. None of us ever got the Eitz Chaim. As Jews, we never got Eitz Chaim. Had we got it, then he would have said so, but he guarded that way. Every rabbi longed to know how to get Chaim inside of us as Adam and Eve had, because if we could get Chaim, we would live forever. And you think the lamb is going to do it? The thing is, my Achim, he had to put his Chaim Be'adom. When he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, he breathed in his nostrils, Nishmar Chaim. And that, and ever since then, it's been lost. Rabbi Orli, he says that, that, that our, the human heart is like the Holy of Holies. It's where the, it's where the, Ruach HaKadosh should be dwelling with inside of us. We know that it should happen, but why doesn't it happen? It can't, because it's guarded. Oh, but there did come a man, Shnei Adam, a second Adam. And yes, he was found without blemish. The sacrifice types him. He does not type the sacrifice. You're looking at it backwards. And when you said that the, 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 the kidneys and, and the innards are to be, and the fat is to be removed and to be burned, to be offered up to Hashem, when he died, do you not realize that what it represents is because inside of his body was Eis Chaim, it was the Shekinah, it was, it was Ihayet. Oh my gosh! Inside of him was Yahi Or. And when that came out of him, that light, that fire, the Ash, the Ish, the Yod, and the Ash together. Chaim. Zechai Shel Yehovah went up to the presence of God. This is why, this is why these were the innards were taken out of the sacrifice and to be burned. To be burned so that it could go up into the presence of the Almighty. Why? Because God knew that when Moshiach was to come, he was to be cut off according to Daniel. So why do you try to say when Moshiach comes that what has to happen when Moshiach comes is supposed to be perfect peace? When you know good and well, Daniel says to us that he will be cut off in the midst 
of the week. At the end of, excuse me, not in the midst of the week, but at the end of the 69th week, Moshiach is to be cut off, but not for himself. For us! Think about that. Think about it. And then you wonder the way. He's trying to say, the seal of circumcision is a blemish? A God-given covenant to Abraham, our forefather. And we call that a blemish? It's not a blemish. He even says to us, circumcise your heart. Because your heart is calloused over with unbelief. You know, I, I, I sit there, I think, whether it be Rabbi Winston, Rabbi Mr. He, whether it be Rabbi uh, Tonya Singer, Nehemiah Gordon. You know, sometimes I think to myself, you know, I, I would like to be the guy there to debate. But you know, the thing is, it's not so much as a debate. My desire is to get you to understand what Hashem is doing, what you're overlooking. We're so caught up with the Talmud. Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Yushalayim, Nishma, or Slecha, the Mishnah. Achim. Makra. Makra. Is the Nishma, or the, or the Talmud, or the Mishnah or, 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 or any of these books, are they going to save us? These are rabbinical opinions. And we try to say it's the oral law. But you know, Nehemiah Gordon, he points out a very good thing. We don't want to hear it, but it's true. You know it's true. How many times do you read the Talmud? You read, you, we see it. How many rabbis don't agree with one another? How many people disagree with Rashi? How many people disagree with Ibn Azra? How many people disagree with Rabbi Orli? It's, it's, it's opinion. If it was the Word of God, it's, it's not the Torah, it's not the Tanakh. We see what the, what the prophets, what the Ben Navim, Ben Kotavim, the Moshe, the Torah, what they say, and, and there's, it's perfectly lines with each other. So how, how, how do we get all mixed up like this? You know, I, mean, I, I understand. I mean, honestly, I can look in Christianity and see all kinds of crazy things out there, but are they any different than we are? We got all kinds of crazy ideas as well. We got every kind of orthodox jewelry out there with different kinds of opinions. But just like the Christians, they say we all have Jesus in common. We say we all believe in Moshe. The man in Moshe. Do we really believe what Moshe said? Do we really believe? He said, I will raise up a prophet. God will raise up a prophet like unto me. True, Moshiach is to bring, to restore, deliver us from the Romans. You know what I find funny about that? Our forefathers were so bad wanted to be delivered from the Romans. Then when we were scattered to all the world, which should be a wake-up call to us, what went wrong then? Tell me why we were scattered. If our forefathers were so religious and had everything right, why did Hashem scatter our people? Every time in our history is because of sin. So what about our piousness? What about our, our righteousness? Ah, oh, but it's interesting, 70 years before, they had this guy called Yeshua. Yeshua. And many of our father, forefathers, many of our brethren believed him to be Moshiach. 
But we want to argue the, the case that it couldn't be Moshiach because Moshiach comes to restore everything. We just bypass Daniel's words. Daniel the prophet where he said to be cut off. We bypass David's word. Was David ever pierced? Was his hands pierced? Did he look upon him and, and, and they wagged the head and they spit out the mouth? Psalm 22, Tehalim. This didn't happen to David. Who's David talking about? What do we want to do? Ignore it? Throw it in the garbage can? Even when Yeshua opens up Yeshayahu and he reads from uh, chapter 61, Isaiah 61, and he reads part of the verse. Verse 1, half of, or verse 2, there you go for the Christians that happen to be listening to the video that sit there and try to say, well, we need to read the whole entire chapter. You know, God sometimes cuts it off in the middle. And it's been 2,000 years waiting for the second half of verse 2 to be fulfilled. Even Yeshua knew that this was going to happen. Now, I have a message for, and, and I, I don't want to pick on this brother very hard. His name is Rob Skiba. And Rob, forgive me, my brother, if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, I haven't actually had, heard how your name is pronounced, so I, I apologize if I say that wrong. <clears throat> Rob used to really stand with Israel at one time. And I don't say that he's not standing with Israel now. He has a different opinion because he believes that the, um, that the mandate of Israel has not been met for the return of our people and that the Rothschilds and the secular groups are not what brings our people to our homeland. And in one way, I agree with him. He says 1948 was not the magic date. Well, I do agree with him in one respect on 1948. 1948 is not Israel being born in one day. That is true. He's right on that. But he's not right when he says that we all have to be believing and everything has to be perfect and we have to be 100% with the word before God will take us back. God said to Abraham, if there's 10 righteous, I'll spare that city. Now, now the city's being divided. We know that. But the thing is, is I'm going to share with you, my brother, uh, a couple of things that I think that would be very important for you. And one is a famous scripture that a lot of people read. And, and I actually, I just happened to open up the book, Israel, Are They Still? It's a book I wrote a little while back, um, a few years ago. But there was a scripture I quoted from Matthew 23. And when I was reading this out of the book that I wrote, I, I was amazed at something I didn't catch when I wrote the book. It says, For I say unto you, this is the words of Yeshua, You shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. How many people take that passage and think that in order for Jesus to return, the Jews have to believe that he is Moshiach? Now, that's true. It has nothing to do, though, with them to return, for the Jews to return to the homeland. They have to be in their homeland to receive Moshiach. So when Jesus actually makes this comment here, I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth. You're not going to see him anymore till, till you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Cometh in the name of, actually, in this case here. Now they got the little L-O-R-D, little or capital L-O-R-D, so it's not uh, uh, Yehovah. But I find this interesting it tells us that the two witnesses are the ones that cause them to recognize who the Mashiach is. Because he says, you won't see me until you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So Israel has to recognize that Yeshua is the Mashiach before he will appear. And I never caught that before. Interesting point. Um, though, okay, now for Brother Rob, Brother Rob, my brother, and I remember you said to me in uh, one of the video responses, or excuse me, on uh, excuse me on Facebook, 
You said I could quote hundreds of scriptures, but it doesn't prove that Israel has a right to return. Let me show you what God himself says about this in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says here, verse 16, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The word of Jehovah. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and, they, and, and by their doings. Their way was before me as an uncleanliness of a, of a uh, removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols, wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed throughout the countries according to their way and according to their doing I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, wherever they went, in other words, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of Jehovah and are gone forth out of his land. So how does the name of God get profaned here? The name of Jehovah? The mere fact that they're scattered. Why would that profane the name, God's name? It's as if God can't keep his word. Think about it. Think about that as we read on. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen. Now, this is the house of Israel. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not do this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen where, wherever you went. Brother Rob, that's unconditional. This is for the sake of God's promise. Okay? This has nothing to do with they got to keep all this. They got to be perfect Jews. They got to have everything just right. Now, that's his words. It's not mine, it's his word. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am Jehovah, saith Jehovah God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now, how's God going to sanctify himself before, their, before our, the heathen? That's the Gentile. That's the goim. He's going to have his name sanctified before our eyes. Now he's going to tell you how he will get that done. and not because they're religious, righteous, or anything else. He makes it clear. It's for his own name's sake. He says, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among them. Okay, we just read that. For I will take, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. No prerequisite at all. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of, out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now you might sit there and think, well, gosh, see, that none of that happens. So this can't be the right time that that happens. Remember Isaiah 61, Jesus read part of the verse. It's taken 2,000 years later, and we still haven't got the other half of verse 2 fulfilled. Don't look at God's word in your own time. And I don't mean that harshly. I just mean it sincerely from my heart. Careful how we judge the Almighty. Careful how we judge His people. It's still the apple of His eye. And believe me, Israel was not a pretty looking, wonderful looking people down through our ages or through our times. We were always, always making mistakes. But what did God do? What happened, what, happened, what happened when Amalek wanted to take Abraham's wife? Amalek, good-hearted man. He thought it was okay because Abraham said, this is my sister. And she said, this is my brother. Now, part of that is true. But they did it 
deceivingly because Abraham was worried about losing his life. And God came to Amalek, the king, and said, you have, he said, you're as good as a dead man, for you have another man's wife. Amalek said, God, you know the integrity of my heart. He said, did not he say that this is my sister? And she said, this is my brother. And God said, I know the integrity of your heart. But unless you restore him, his wife, you and your whole nation will be destroyed. And he also added a little clause in there. Have him pray for you. The man that deceived Amalek have him pray for you. Quit looking at Israel from a natural, carnal perception. You look upon them because they don't agree with the Christian doctrine. How can you blame them? They were born a priestly nation for the purpose to offer sacrifice for sins, including to offer Yeshua for the saving of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. How could we look down upon them? How could you look down upon the Jewish people? The price that it's taken for the gospel to be brought to you. Jesus died himself and suffered like no other man could ever suffer. But if you ever looked at the suffering of the Jews for the last 2,000 years, reaping what they sowed, because the scripture says, you sow to the wind, you shall reap a whirlwind, a storm. And the sowing of the wind is planting the Spirit. We tried to bury Christ. He was filled with the Spirit of God and we tried to put him in the ground. It was prophetic. You reap a storm. And our people have reaped and reaped and reaped for the benefit of the Gentile world for 2,000 years. And then you look down upon the Jews because it's kind of like Rutherford, the Jehovah's Witness guy, when he went to Israel, he was all for the Jews until they didn't accept the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Well, they're in their homeland. They should believe. There are Jews that do believe. There are Jews that are believing now. I don't want them to go into paganism, but they are believing. If they recognize Yeshua to be the Son of God. I thank God for that. Did He die for their sins? I thank God for that. Did He God manifested in flesh? I thank God for that. And no, Rabbi Singer, it is not three different gods. Do we got to pay homage to one and homage to another and homage to another one? No, it's not. And there's good Trinitarians that know that. There's many of them that, 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 that listen to these videos. And, and my brother, sister, I thank God for you that, that you have dealt with me as harshly as I've dealt with this subject. And I've never gone into a deep like I should for you but I need to because we're close really in what we think. And many of you have the right revelation in the first place. But anyway, let me, let me finish this up for, for Rob here. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all the filthiness, etc. We know that. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. This is when they recognize Yeshua to be Mashiach. Now remember, these verses just doesn't all happen at one time. It could be over years. But the thing is, he first returns us to the homeland, not for our sake, but for his sake. And by the way, every time you say the prayer that Yeshua, Jesus instructed you, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You've been praying for the return of Israel to the homeland. And it's funny though, because the Jews have been doing it too. They just didn't know it either. When Moshe commanded us to wear the netzit, which is the, the garment that we wear on us with the four fringes, 
It was also so that we would remember to pray to return us from the four corners of the earth. When Ruth the Moabitess was gleaning the four corners of Boaz's field, as a Christian, God gave you a sign that you're to harvest, you're to reap for the Jews that are in the four corners of the earth and bring them home. Where, where did Ruth take the grain that she got out of the four corners? To Naomi, to Israel. So many types that are out there. Where are the Esthers, the true bride, that sees Israel about to be annihilated, it looks like. It is willing to go in the presence of the Almighty God and plea our case. God will send Moses and Elijah soon. And Brother Chris Ray, God bless you. Brother Chris is the, uh, gosh, Brother Chris, forgive me, I hope he posts on the comments. You guys look in the comments. I'm sure Brother Chris will watch this video here. He did the, uh, the uh, Bible code. He's a Bible code expert. And he did uh, one on the solar flares uh, and, uh, for 5775 in the Jewish calendar. This will be happening, I think, in 2015 in the uh, Gregorian calendar. Uh, how the rapture, many things come up in there. Well, uh, Brother Chris ran my name in there. And of course... To shock to me, it ran right across there. And I knew that there had been another rabbi that had confirmed that, that the name Dinun was in the book of Exodus. Actually, quite a few times it fell in the book of Exodus. And I don't know how much of a rarity of something like this is, but at a skip space of 17, it falls right where God says to Moses, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall say. He ran my name just the way I had told him I'd heard that it was. And I'd actually seen it. It's actually on my website. I actually posted a picture there of that. But when Chris ran some key words in there, it was astounding to me. And <clears throat> to make matters even more interesting, and, and I know Brother Chris is going to post this before too long as well. Um, and, and there again, my brother, sister, it is no big eyes, little use, nothing like that. God knows my heart. I, I, I don't know what my purpose is in life. I have been praying. I've sought for years to understand what he wants me to do. I know he's called me to deal with my people, to speak to the Jewish people. And I've always kind of leaned towards the idea that I'm dealing with the secular Jews that are not just secular, but the Orthodox Jews and stuff around the world that have not returned to the homeland. And I believe that that's where God deals with me at as my own brethren. Encourage them to go home. And that's something I need to do a video on as well. Go home. I don't care what the conditions are. Go home. Moshiach is coming to Israel. He's not coming to the U.S. He's not coming to Canada. He's coming to Israel. And unless you recognize Moshiach before going home, if you recognize him now, then there's really not a whole lot of need for going home. I'll say that to you as well. But, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Brother Chris said that Brother Matthew, and I don't know Brother Matthew as of yet. I've not met him, another Torah code searcher. But... Uh, this is something I'm really curious about as well. But he said, not just your last name, Brother Steve, your full name is in the Torah code. And so I'm just very much humbled by if these things really are so. I, I don't know. I, I do believe the Torah code is real. We've seen uh, Michael Drosnin who brought out uh, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and that he would be assassinated. It's what popularized the whole Bible code thing to begin with. And, and Chuck Missler, many, many scholars that know that there's a lot of truth to the code. I don't say that that makes me anybody special by no means. I mean, I'm sure many other people's names are in the code. But from what I understand, it's a rarity to, uh, to have it, especially, it seems, the way that mine has come up. I think my name is like 42 times in the book of Exodus. Uh, and very tight codes as well. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I hope this video has blessed you. And uh, I trust if you're a Jewish brother, sister, write me at IsraelReturns at AOL.com. If there's anything I can do to help you, give you, get you a book or something that might encourage you, I'll talk about the redemption of Israel in the book Yom Suf. Uh, if I could pray with you. And uh, also, I want to thank 
so many of you uh, that have been so kind to try to support this ministry. Not just try, you do. And more and more we're getting closer to that point to where we believe God wants us to be with this. So we're, we're wanting to bring you daily updates, not such in-depth long ones like this here. There's just so much I felt in my heart to say, and once I got going, I just didn't stop. So please forgive me for that length of time, but I hope it's a blessing for you. And uh, again, like I said, I want to do a video for Nehemiah Gordon. I want to address that debate of Tobias Singer. I've noticed many of his debates are pretty much the same. And by God's grace, I know the answer to most of the things that he deals with. Um, so anyway, till we meet again, hopefully before too long for you sisters that have been waiting too for my wife to come back on with me to speak more about women in the Bible. A lot of things are going to shock you. Uh, a lot of things, I'm sure it will. It'll be a blessing. Uh, anyway, God bless you till we meet again.